This reflection has to do with an account that's in the Synoptic Gospels, but we're going to focus on the account in Mark. This is the woman with the hemorrhage as well as the healing of the synagogue official's daughter. So this is in the fifth chapter of Mark, starting at the 25th verse. So in this particular one, you really have to go to the Dewey Reams to read, and I would highly suggest that you read that Dewey Reams account. But just some takeaways from that is how to apply the concepts of reclamation theology, Catholic conscience, Catholic thought, Catholic disposition, if you will, to a story. As St. Thomas says, the authors of a particular parable, or even Jesus as the teller of a parable, begins to impart information in such a way as there's a ranking or there is a significance in the sequence. My observation is if you look at these and read this in this way, it's as if the artist puts a wash on a canvas or prepares the lime plaster for the fresco, mixes the colors. And then what they would usually do is paint the background, the trees, the buildings, the things that are going to provide the background. They paint all of that. And so it gives context to the foreground. And then the foreground is painted last. And that's the closest to you. It's the first as you come to the painting, but it's not the first thing that begins to shape the infusion of the painting. And so you're seeing all of this at the same time. And so sequencing of things, layering on is very important. So anytime we hear the word woman in the old form, in the traditional form, uh, all the Gospels readings or most of them start with Elo Tempore Yesu. At that time, Jesus, and then it starts. And at that time, Jesus is traveling to Jairus' house. And what happens is we now get this description, a woman. So whenever we hear Jesus and a woman, for us as Catholics, the first we have to think of the first woman. And we have to think of the perfect woman. So we have to think of Eve and we have to think of Mary. And this sudden imaging is so huge in our mind. A woman plagued with a hemorrhage. So we know that even if we don't have to stop and parse it out, what's happening interiorly, what's happening in the resonance of our soul is we realize a hemorrhage, she's unclean. The issue of blood was an evil act evil being simply defined as that which is against nature, that which is disordered. So for blood to flow out of the body, this is a a disordered act. And so the Jews would have seen this. Now, blood flow as associated with a woman, immediately we think, and it's correct in the Greek, that this is requisite with her being a woman. And so there is an interrupted fecundity. There's an issue with being fruitful. There's an issue with generation. There's an issue with bringing forth life. And so she's unclean. It's a result of a disordered and evilness with regard to her femininity, with regard to her womanhood, not realized as motherhood. That's so very important. And so there's a frustrated office of motherhood here. And then we get for 12 years. She had suffered this. Anytime we hear 12, immediately there is the connection that there are 12 tribes. This is Israel. This woman represents Israel. This woman represents the chosen people in all 12 tribes, no exception. It's not that she had suffered for 11 years or for 10 years. It's for 12 years, one year for each of the tribes. And then as we bring it forward into the church, 12 apostles. And so there's a totality. You you even take it a little bit further that we understand that anytime we mention Israel, we see them marching out of Egypt in the Exodus. Their marching configuration was in a four-sided configuration, three tribes on each side, three tribes to the north, three tribes to the south, three to the west, three to the east. And they would rotate 
side to side so that each day there would be three new tribes in the four, three new tribes to the right, three new tribes to the left, three new tribes to the back. And so we see that in this 12, there's this configuration in the Exodus, the three, spiritual three, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, represented by each of the three tribes, then to the four corners of the earth, east, west, north, south. Together, that's seven. The four and the three is seven. When you add them, and this is the temporal four and the spiritual perfection of three. So all of this is playing in our minds, whether we realize it or not. This is the subliminal. This is the the beauty of the sublime. This is the subliminal message that's resonating in your soul. So we see her as Israel. We see her as thwarted motherhood, a failure to be fruitful. And then there's no discourse as to whether this is her own fault. This is a curse. This is, it, that's irrelevant. We don't get that information. But then when she touches the hem of Jesus' garment, this is so very important because that language, this was the prayer shawl. This was the hem. This was the lowest part of his garment. And so there would have been 10 tassels on the Jewish prayer shawl. They would have been the lowest portion They would have been nearest the earth. They would have been where God comes in contact with the earth. So at depth of his condescension to man, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, he is wearing and obeying the law, the shawl with the tassels. And so it is her touching this that heals her. And it's not the Pharisaic arrogant, look, we're fulfilling the law. She touches it out of adoration, out of devotion. This is a Psalm 119, Lord, I love your laws. Let me meditate upon on the precepts. And the moment that Israel grasped the law out of admiration, devotion, the moment the woman grasped the tassel of the Messiah, she's healed. And the power goes out and flows through the law into the nation. And she is healed, and the hemorrhage stops, thereby returning her system, her body, her the nation to fruitfulness when they avail themselves of the law through devotion, through adoration of the law, not in the servile adherence to it, nor in the arrogant, pompous exercising of the law for public display. She's quiet. She simply comes to him in the crowd. She risks being declared unclean, and she touches his garment. This is in the quiet, even though there's all the hubbub of the world and and everything around her. Now, he's on his way to heal the 12-year-old daughter of the synagogue official. So the synagogue official, what this tells you is this is the sacristan, this is the acolyte, this is one of many offices that make worship, that facilitate worship. And they also, out of this class, these are Levites, but out of this class will come the priestly class. This girl, as a 12-year-old girl, she lays there dead. So it's this frustrated fecundity or fruitfulness. All the promise of future priests, all the promise of future officials, synagogue, worshipers, all of her fruitful potential lays dead. And at a word from the Christ and a touch from the Christ, she is restored, not just to life for her, but all of the fruitfulness, all the promise of her womb, all of the unrealized fecundity, her beautiful and magnificent virginity now placed at the service of God and or the nation to repopulate with holy souls. And so these two images, these two stories, there is so much depth there. There's so much to see. Reclamation theology opens our eyes to what our fathers knew and our forefathers, our grandfathers, and others knew. This was what they talked about. This is what they thought about. This was the fruit of their prayer. And so a lot of it has to do with going about the business of being Catholic on a daily basis not the business of going about being American or a Democrat or a Republican or a white guy or a black guy or a brown guy. It's being Catholic and living for it. These are the things that have eternal value. 